Okay, we are ready. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Engelsberg Annual Lecture in Applied History 2020 edition. I'm the chair of this event. My name is Flavia Gasbarri, and I am a lecturer in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, King's College London a member of the KCL Center for Grand Strategy, which is hosting this event tonight. Uh, before introducing our great speakers tonight and the topic of the lecture, let me just say a few words on the Engelsberg Program for Applied History, Grand Strategy and Geopolitics, of which this annual lecture is a part. Uh, the program was launched in October 20, uh, 2018, and it represents a unique partnership between the Center for Grand Strategy, uh, the World Studies Department at King's College London, and the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge uh, University. The program is funded by the Axel and Margaret Axel Johnson Foundation that we of course thank for the uh, sponsorship. So uh, the topic of the lecture this year is war and order, how China is using history to reshape global order and the new nationalism at home. Tonight we have a, a great panel. I'm very happy to chair this uh, event and to introduce you uh, our guests. Starting with uh, our uh, speaker, Professor Rana Mitter, who is the uh, director of the University China Center, professor of the history and politics of modern China and a fellow of St. Cross College at the University of Oxford. He's an expert on China, particularly the emergence of nationalism in modern China. He has extensively researched and published on this topic. His latest book, uh, which came out this year for Harvard University Press, is entitled China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. Professor Mitter uh, also presents and contributes regularly uh, to programs on television and radio. So he's also very active on the media, commenting uh, on contemporary Chinese politics and society. Let me also introduce our uh, discussant, Dr. Julian Wertz, uh, who is Senior Fellow for uh, China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's a fellow of the Columbia Harvard China the World uh, and the World Program and a lecturer in history at Columbia University. He has also extensively published on China. Let me just mention uh, his book, Unlikely Partners, Chinese Reformers, Western Economists and the Making of Global China, published in 2017 for Harvard University Press. Uh, he has also published on many academic journals, as well as on newspapers, Washington Post, Guardian, Financial, Financial Times, and on others. So thank you very much to both of you uh, for being here uh, tonight. I'm going to leave you the floor in a moment. Um, uh, just let me say something, some housekeeping information. Um, uh, Professor Mitter is going to speak for uh, 40 uh, minutes approximately, then we will have a, a comment from Dr. Wirtz, and then we will open the uh, floor to your comments and uh, questions. Uh, you can post comments and questions on the Q&A section that you can find at the bottom of, the, um, of, your, of your screen, and I will uh, moderate that. All right, so that's all for me. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I leave the floor to our speaker, Professor Mitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to Dr. Gasbarri. And uh, thank you for joining us from uh, wherever you're currently sitting, possibly in places around Britain and indeed around the world today for the annual Engelsberg Lecture. I think in a sense, none of us would have wanted to have it in the circumstances of the pandemic, but the one very small but real advantage is that of course one can bring in people from all sorts of places who couldn't normally make it to King's College London and indeed involve them in the conversation. And I'd also like to thank the Centre for Grand Strategy and the Centre for Geopolitics, Cambridge, uh, King's London, sorry, King's London, Cambridge, respectively, for hosting me this evening. It's a huge honour to give a talk, which I know has a short but actually very distinguished um, history. So thank you for that. I'd also actually just like to, at this point, thank uh, Julian Lewitz for coming in and uh, commenting as well. I know he's someone with an immense number of calls on his time, so I feel very privileged. 
I use the word conversation, and I think particularly since I'm aware that we have a very large online audience uh, today, or at least large for those of us who are used to toiling in more academic uh, obscurity, and therefore um, I probably will not speak even for as long as 40 minutes. I'll try and keep it to about 35 or so to make some remarks, which gives us time to use um, not only um, a bit of time for commentary from uh, uh, Dr. Gewirtz, but also uh, I hope some questions from all of you, which I'd be very happy to bring into a bit more discussion and uh, we should finish certainly shortly after the hour. So I don't want to take up too much time with, uh, with just speaking. But I would like to try and get over one particular point today. And I'm going to do that, if I may, by also showing some images. And this is always the great moment of a Zoom talk to see if the share screen function is working correctly. Give me a moment here. We'll see where we are. Yes, this is fine, I think. Um, let me just select this. Yes, that's good. Uh, you are screen sharing from the current slide. Lovely. So let me show you this, uh, which is the box from a uh, DVD. And bearing in mind, I'm speaking, I hope to at least a partly an undergraduate audience, I should explain that a DVD was a very ancient technology uh, shortly after the invention of books that was used once to hold video images. But people like us of a certain age do remember it from back in the, uh, back in the day. So this was the DVD box of a television production, uh, HBO production, that was released in the year 2010. In fact, in that year, 2010, two new productions hit Chinese and American screens, respectively. So for US television viewers, it was this production, Hollywood Power Team of uh, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks produced The Pacific, a 10 episode epic about a US Marine uh, division in the Pacific theater of World War II. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a successor actually to the very successful Band of Brothers. The Pacific didn't take off quite as, uh, as much, but it was still pretty popular and, and I think well received. So a long way away in China in the same year, all of 10 years ago, 2010, moviegoers in the days also for the younger people, cinemas used to be things we used to have until a little while ago or movie theaters in which you would go and see a film without having to have Netflix in the comfort of your own home because you weren't allowed to go outside. And when you could do that, you could see this, Dong, uh, Dong Feng Yu, uh, East Wind Rain, a lush drama starring um, major names, including um, Fan Bingbing, uh, China, Chinese movie star rising to fame, who would later become slightly more famous for her tax declarations uh, as opposed to her film productions, but that's a, a slightly different story. Um, the plot of this film, uh, some of you may have seen it, but if you haven't, it's, it's quite a good watch, actually. Um, it hangs on an intelligence discovery by Chinese communist secret agents in 1941, in the months and weeks leading up to Pearl Harbor. And in the movie, uh, they make a discovery that the attack is about to happen on Pearl Harbor and they get the information through to the administration of US President Franklin D. Roosevelt, but the Americans being the Americans, sorry, Julian, uh, of course, ignore what the sensible Chinese have to say, and poor old Pearl Harbor is, is bombed into pieces nonetheless. It's a fantastic story, well put together. The only problem is, of course, it's entirely fictional. It's not based on any uh, actual historical evidence whatsoever. But that doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter comes up when we look at some discussion of these two productions, uh, The Pacific right there and East Wind Rain there. And to give you the discussion, I'm going to quote from a figure again, perhaps better known to those of you who keep an eye on Chinese social media or have done over the last decade or so. A blogger called uh, Sima Pingbang, uh, well-known neo-Maoist amongst uh, other things. I hope he wouldn't uh, blanch at that description. He co-wrote a piece along with another uh, blogger uh, with the following title, uh, his title, not mine, I should add. Why are China and the United States both rewriting the history of the Pacific War. And it's a really interesting blog piece, actually very long, very thoughtful. And in it, um, Sima Pingbang and his co-author, Ming Shalong, analyze both of these works, the TV show and the movie. And they draw from this a wider narrative, a wider story about what's happening in both countries, America and China, uh, in terms of trying to claim a political legacy from the years of World War II. And so here's a quote from the, the piece. If you peel below the surface of the stories of justice and heroism, then there is this hidden tendency towards conspiracy and competition 
in their own interests. And again, one of the things I think is so prophetic in a way, one of the reasons I want to bring it up, all this was written in 2010, you know, 10 years ago when these films are brought out. And if anything, it's more of a uh, meaningful statement today than it was, uh, uh, than it was a decade ago. Um, so they go on to discuss the meaning of these two productions. Uh, they point out actually, as Western critics did too, that uh, this movie East Wind Rain is not actually a sort of super jingoistic, super nationalistic production. It's quite thoughtful and um, it's, uh, it's, it's well made, but nonetheless, they do see what, they, what the, the filmmaker is, uh, is trying to do um, because they point out that essentially the film gives China the upper rhetorical hand. China is the good guy in this film by suggesting that Pearl Harbor was essentially an American failure that could have been solved if they had only listened to Chinese advice. And by implication, this is a rejection of any viewpoint that if China did anything in World War II, it was like a victim that was waiting to be rescued by the Americans, the Flying Tigers and, and, and others. Uh, they also discussed the American show, The Pacific. Uh, I have to say that uh, I've been very careful because I'm aware that this talk is in public and uh, it's being recorded, but it does sometimes seem that Chinese audiences are uh, able to watch American box office releases and HBO releases before they are officially released in uh, the Chinese market, or indeed, even if they have not always been officially released in the Chinese market, I say no more. Um, anyway, they did a good discussion of The, uh, the Pacific in which they said, um, what this series, the Pacific, this is word, their words again, what this series, the Pacific says is because the Americans saved people from the claws of the demon Japanese, and as I say, that's their phrase, not mine, so please don't take it up with them. Because of that, they say, that's why the United States gets to have the strongest army in the world. And the two writers conclude their blog piece with the following words, and I think these are, are pretty wise words, actually. The release of these two films, technically one is a TV show, but fine. These two films is not just about their plots or their performances. Just as the United States lets the world know that at a most dangerous time for humanity, meaning the Second World War, it bore burdens and it made sacrifices. So China has finally dared to propagate in the same way, the idea that during the war, it too bore burdens and sacrifices. And they go on to conclude their thoughts with, this represents another type of continuity of the competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries. And that phrase, the competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries, if it was a hot ticket in the year 2010, there is no doubt that this is possibly one of the two or three global conversations that matters more than any other in our present moment. I say two or three because some of us think climate change is pretty important, although China and the US are not exactly absent from that either. And I'm sure you could come up with thoughts about the Middle East, refugee issues and, and other things too. So I don't want to suggest China and the US is, uh, or China and the West even is excluding everything else, but let's be honest, it's pretty darn important. The missing element, I would argue, in an awful lot of this discussion, and the one that I do want to bring up today, is the way in which one particular type of collective memory, collective memory of China's experience during the Second World War, is at the heart of the way that China thinks about its position in both domestic politics and international society today. It's not the only thing by a very, very long way that China thinks about. And we could all name four or five other things from you know, revived Confucian thought to economic pro progress, uh, along with military buildup that, that we have to put in that list. But I do think that the World War II framework is one that has, in a sense, been underplayed. And it's the subject of the new book, which uh, Flavia very kindly mentioned at the, uh, the beginning, uh, that I've been looking at this, uh, this topic. And I want to use just one aspect, because time is limited today, to explain why I think that World War II framework and China's understanding of framework is so important for today's China. And today, particularly, I'm going to talk, because it is the Engelsberg Lecture, about international relations. But before I explain the importance of that, let me just take a minute to explain the significance of China's experience in World War II. I can't go into huge details here. If you want the real full details, please do you know, read my earlier book on the history of World War II in, uh, in, in China. But a few key bullet points, a few key statistics, I think give an idea of why it was such a big deal, why it's so strange that I think that it's so underplayed in the Western understanding of World War II, 
and why the Chinese get a little bit um, uh, resentful, I think, at times when the West doesn't always acknowledge this. So China fought in World War II longer than any other allied power, 1937, when war broke out against Japan, till 1945. Although we don't still even now have accurate statistics on deaths, and we may never have them, certainly the number seems to be well north of 10 million, if you include other factors such as environmental, famine, uh, disease, as well as the actual physical deaths from for civilians and military. Uh, 80 to 100 million Chinese became refugees in their own country during the course of that time. And that's a very significant portion of humanity, let alone China's own population. And China's very carefully and painfully won infrastructure of the era, the railways, the roads, the marketing networks were pretty much smashed into pieces by the war. But not incidentally, and perhaps the, if you might say, the key fact in terms of thinking, well, that's all very well for China, but why does that matter for the rest of us? China, for, best, for the best part of four and a half years until the West came along at Pearl Harbor, uh, held down over half a million Japanese troops, who, if China had surrendered in 1938 or 39, could have been redeployed to attack the Soviet Union, to attack Southeast Asia, to take on even British India across the Himalayas. So while these are all, we can't go too far into the realms of speculative history, the point is that China's resistance in World War II does matter, and it's something that was not talked about in any kind of great detail until um, really quite recently. And a very short period, I must say recently, within the last few decades, and a short reason for that is that under Chairman Mao, the historical but inconvenient fact that the great rivals of the communists, the Guomindang nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, the then leader at the time, played a very significant role in the defeat of the Japanese, along with the guerrilla warfare of the Communist Party, which you know, should also be very much acknowledged in the picture. So without going into more detail now about the history of World War II, you'll have to take my word that it was an important set of uh, events over, over eight years for the Chinese people and their history. That changing social and collective memory of war in the present day, I would suggest, has significantly shaped China's international relations in the present century, and certainly I would say in the year 2020, and I'm going to go on and give you some examples of what I mean in just a few minutes. Now, the reason I brought up the US-China relationship as the first framework I want to talk about is because actually there's a common assumption that I want to, you know, knock down a little bit, and that's the idea that the Chinese desire to revive memory of World War II in Asia, and on Chinese soil in particular, is primarily about giving a kind of rhetoric, a rhetorical battering to Japan, trying to push Japan back and make Japan acknowledge what it did during the wartime period. And I would suggest that while, of course, that is one part of what's going on, actually, it's not the majority part of what China is doing with its ideas about World War II in the present day, or even the most important part. In fact, I'd suggest there are three different elements, at least, that uh, shape China's use of World War II collective memory in its international relations today. Um, the first one is to do with Japan, of course, uh, the continued anger at Japanese war crimes, such as the famous Nanjing massacre or rape of Nanking, as it was known at the time in 1937. In addition, though, um, and, and that links to a desire to, I think, prevent Japan from gaining too much prominence in international society. But I think the relationship with America and how that's in part, <coughs> excuse me, mediated through World War II is also extremely interesting. And that, in a nutshell, is based on the idea that China is kind of resentful about the fact that the U.S. continues to use the memory of its wartime role in Asia 75 years on to continue a hegemonic role, which, of course, it does have today. And what China does with that as I'll show, is to try and rewrite what you might call the myths of origin, the 1945 story about the end of World War II and why bringing China into that story should help us to think in a new way about the world order in the year 2020. And finally, in terms of the, 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 the links between World War II and international relations, I should mention countries like South Korea, with which China sometimes try to reach out to uh, create a sort of sense of 
Asian solidarity usually aimed against the Japanese on issues such as the forced uh, female sex workers, sometimes known as comfort women, who um, uh, Japan uh, 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 abused during uh, the wartime period. The problem with China using that as a point of commonality with a country like South Korea is that Chinese diplomacy tends to zigzag between wanting to create these bonds of, uh, um, uh, of closeness and then suddenly turning around and slapping sanctions or uh, uh, soft boycotts on South Korean goods because they accept uh, American military support. So uh, it's not a very even or I would suggest very success successful policy on that part. But I'd say that China's language about the war years and wanting to commemorate them and have the rest of the world appreciate China's uh, contribution during that time is driven by a much bigger issue that is very big in international relations. So for those of you who are primarily IR theorists and scholars and, and students rather than necessarily China people, I'm pointing to the issue of justice in international relations, an issue on which very many people have written very extensively. I think of my own uh, brilliant uh, uh, Oxford colleague, Andrew Hurrell, but there are many, many others. Uh, I'd also cite a wonderful recent book by Professor Catherine Liu of uh, the University of uh, Toronto, and many others uh, write on in this area with, with great um, astuteness. So in this context to do with justice, I'd say there's a sense that official China wants to put out, and I think it's felt quite popularly as well, that somehow China has been cheated China has been done wrong in the international order, and it deserves to have its status and claims treated with greater seriousness than they are at the moment. So, of course, that has to do with realist elements. China wanted to increase its power and reach, uh, whether military, economic or indeed cultural as well. But, you know, things like gunboats in the South China Sea obviously come uh, come to mind. How could they not? I think there's another impetus, though, which is where World War II comes in which is that China doesn't just want to be seen as a powerful state in Asia and beyond, which it certainly is. It also wants to be seen as a moral and ethical state in terms of its shaping of world order. And that has so far been a much harder call. Certainly it's something China itself, which has achieved an almost obsessive desire for what uh, Joseph Nye has called soft power, uh, does tend to uh, tend to show. And I will suggest that World War II and collective memory of it is at least one effort to try and create a sort of moral narrative and ethical ballast for the Chinese project of global uh, rise that currently isn't fully there. Um, in this respect, uh, I would say that um, it is part of a uh, wider set of links that also come with uh, areas like the economic development that China is seeking to offer through its famous Belt and Road Initiative. And I'll come back to that a little later in the in the talk. So I want to take that one thread and now give you a bit more historical depth to explain where we go with it. So if we accept the idea that over the last you know, few years, certainly. China has been talking about itself much more as a kind of guardian of the international order, the post-1945, post-war order, particularly in the era of President Trump, who has not been, um, uh, who's been the first post-war US president to really not seem to be very concerned with keeping America's role as the guarantor of the international order uh, as a primary role for the United States. Uh, at the time I'm speaking, we don't yet know who the next president of the United States is going to, to be. So if you're watching this on YouTube later on, then you probably found out. But at the moment, I think it's fair to say that people around the world are looking at the outcome of that election actually as a message as to what direction the United States will go in terms of the international uh, international system. And if we end up in a direction where the Trump policy continues, then I think China's desire to claim ownership of that post-1945 order is going to become even more um, uh, uh, strongly expressed. But I want to point out that this is not new. It wasn't just invented within the last you know, two or three uh, years. Instead, the idea of China as a shaper of the post-war order, I think first begins to emerge in the 1980s. Uh, so, you know, more than 30 years, maybe 30 to 40 years ago, something like that. And as a result, um, we need to bring up this gentleman here. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Hu Qiaomu. Uh, if not, he was a man who certainly lived life to the full in, in certain ways. He was an early communist revolutionary, very much by Mao's side, including in Yan'an, uh, the communist base area in northwest China during World War II. 
very, very hardline character in terms of his uh, devotion to uh, Chinese communist doctrine, and the author of several actually quite important historical uh, works in the early period of the of the Mao era. He ended up as the president of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. If my memory serves me right, he also ended up purging various of the academics on whom he, he regarded as being too liberal during his time there, but certainly a very important figure in terms of the shaping of Chinese communist ideology in the reform era, uh, after Mao had died, when Deng Xiaoping had taken over in the 1980s and indeed in the early 90s till his, his death, but also someone who was very conscious of history specifically. And that matters in this particular case because in 1987, in his quite senior role, Hu Tiamu published an editorial in the People's Daily, the major newspaper, if you want to call it that, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I mean, I always hesitate when the People's Daily, Ramin Rubar, is described as a newspaper. So it doesn't really deal in news in the way that most papers that we think of put forward. I mean, people don't tend to do it for the crossword or the, the sports results. Uh, although, you know, one never knows quite what's on the on the back. People read it more as a sort of exercise in trying to understand the runes, you might say, of what's happening in the Chinese communist leadership. So, for instance, in recent editions, and certainly within the last year or so, the name of Xi Jinping, the current president of China and general secretary of the Communist Party, which actually is the latter is rather more important in, in some ways, appears many, many times uh, on the front page and most other pages, suggesting that his grip over policy dominance, which has not been minimal, is certainly remaining pretty pretty strong in all sorts of ways. So the People's Daily is the place to go if you want to see what's blowing in the ideological uh, wind. And in 1987, he published um, an editorial about the, what he called, and this is Hu Tiamu's phrasing I'm uh, using here in my own translation, immense significance of what China has tended to call World War II, at least until recently. And that is the phrase, the war of resistance against Japanese uh, aggression or just against Japan. So sort of Kangjan is the uh, abbreviated uh, Japanese, uh, so Chinese version uh, of that. And in this piece, I mean, it's a long piece, got lots of interesting things uh, in it. Well, if you're interested in the historiography of uh, uh, modern China, but the following part is where he really kind of gets to grips with the international order. And he wrote, the war against Japan, Second World War, has great significance for China's revolutionary history. But another great significance of our war of resistance is that it fundamentally changed the international politics of the Far East. And again, the words Far East are not terms that we necessarily hear very much anymore, but since uh, he used the term Yuan Dong in this case, uh, it's Hu Chaomu and not me being politically incorrect. So you can take it up with, uh, his, uh, 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 with him or in his uh, Marxist after, afterlife. So, he says that it fundamentally changed the international politics of the Far East. And he added, before the conclusion of the eight years of the War of Resistance, Japanese imperialism was running rampant. But then he goes on in 1945, the Soviet army eliminated the Japanese Guangdong army and entered Korea. And then he goes through a whole variety of things that happened in the post-war, uh, mentions the Tokyo war crimes trials in 1948, at which Japanese war criminals were condemned. Um, and then he, he reaches the end point by saying, just one year later, the People's Republic of China declared its foundation, 1949, of course, and he adds, the old China that was called the sick man of East Asia would not return. At the same time, the old structure of the Far East and the old structure of the world would not return. Bearing in mind, that's 1987. Several decades on, I think that Hu Tiamu's statement appears, again, almost prophetic, a sort of incipient version of a new version of international order waiting to come into being. Don't forget, or put yourself in that mindset if you're young enough to have absolutely no conception of the 19, 1980s, that in 1987, many, many assumptions about international order would be proved to be false and very quickly. And the most obvious one was the idea that the, United, the Soviet Union was a fixture that would be around for a very long time. And bearing in mind that in 87, although things were warming up, in some ways, the relationship between the United States and China um, were correct and warm in a way that perhaps was still not quite as true for the Soviet Union and China, which was still 
working through the back of a very difficult relationship from the 1960s onwards. And I should add here that if you want to read a really outstanding account of how the 1980s and foreign influences, including American economic influence, changed uh, China, do read our commentator's work, uh, Julian De Wertz's um, Unlikely Partners, which is published by Harvard Press and is uh, an absolutely fantastic read on this question of how, as he says, unlikely partners, Americans, Westerners, economists, and Chinese Marxists got together to create what turned out to be one of the world's most impressive economic uh, miracles. So Hu Jiamu is definitely saying that things have changed and are going to uh, change at that, uh, at that point. But the significance, for, I think, of Hu Jiamu's statement that perhaps the biggest deal when it came to the international, sorry, to the Second World War was changing the international order was that he was, I was going to say by implication, but actually it's not really implication, it's, it's a statement really, saying that the, world, the Second World War was the point of origin for the contemporary international system. And that sounds very mainstream to us living in the West, because we all think, you know, 1945, you know, well, before and after that, Bretton Woods, Dumbarton Oaks, um, uh, signing of the UN Charter, San Francisco, you know, all of the things you can name, Charter of Human Rights, 1948, all of that is the point of origin of what we're still living with today. But of course, for the People's Republic of China for a very long time, it was not the norm and was very much at the other side of a system that they were not actually included uh, in for a very long, uh, long time. So this idea of um, framing 1945 as a sort of point of origin for the order which China was in was something quite new, I think, in 1987. And it's even more interesting that by implication, this is implication rather than statement, but I think it's quite a strong implication. He is bringing the story of China's old ideological allies, the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party, who, by the way, he hated with a passion. There's lots of stories about how he you know, couldn't stand the, uh, I mean, he regarded essentially Chiang Kai-shek as being a fascist by another, another name. But even so, the establishment of Chi a Chinese judge, Mei Ru'ao, at the Tokyo war crimes trial in 1948 was an indication that at least some action that had happened before the establishment of the People's Republic had a certain amount of um, validity. So the founding of the PRC and this idea, as he puts it, of ending the idea of China as a sort of sick man uh, of, uh, of, of Asia uh, was tied up with a set of changes uh, which meant that China was to steal the famous phrase of Dean Acheson, the former American Secretary of State under Harry Truman, present at the creation of the uh, international world uh, world order. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, the Hu Chiamu would have particularly wanted to quote Dean Acheson, who was not really his kind of uh, kind of guy. But in a sense, I think they were on the, the same page on that one. So during I'm going to fast forward now. So that's 1987 and Hu Chiamu. And during the next quarter century or so, if we move very, very fast into the, uh, the kind of more present day phase of, of what I have to, uh, to say, official and popular interest in the Second World War continued to rise in all sorts of ways in China. And I'm sorry that I don't have time in this talk to talk about the really interesting, I think, domestic changes in which you know, novelists write new novels, people produce new movies, um, social media warriors you know, start debating the fine points, the Battle of Shanghai, whatever it might be, but really a sort of World War II oriented discourse. And not always a very um, you know, kind of singular narrative, but one with lots of different aspects to it, emerged in China during those years. And the rehabilitation of the old Guomindang war record, uh, the re record of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, meant that there was more opportunity to bring their involvement into the story that the People's Republic wanted to tell overseas. They weren't doing it out of some kind of bleeding heart uh, affection for their old enemies on Taiwan. There was a very pragmatic set of reasons to want to do this. Let me give you an example. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to move the picture around here. Okay, so those of you who know World War II history might be aware of this particular event, the conference, uh, Allied Conference at Cairo in November 1943, and a splendid picture of it here in which we have uh, Chiang Kai-shek, the then Chinese leader, um, sitting uh, in equal status, which was a very big deal at the time, with President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, and of course, Madame Sung Mei Ling, uh, possibly the single most influential female political actor in the world at that time, I'd say, with the possible exception of Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, there were not huge numbers of powerful women to choose from 
even as recently as the early 20th century. But Madame Chiang Kai-shek is definitely up there in that, uh, in that categorization, I would say. Um, but you know, despite the very important symbolic uh, nature of uh, China being seen as an equal wartime ally, it's fair to say that this was not an event that perhaps was terribly well known. But in November 2013, there was huge flurries of interest in China in the um, 70th anniversary of the Cairo conference. And when we looked at why this might be, it was to do with a very contemporary issue. In fact, in particular, it was based on the following words, which were in something called the Cairo Declaration or Cairo Communique, the uh, short document put out at the end of the conference signed essentially by, by Roosevelt, Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek. And the last words of the declaration are, the terms of the Cairo Declaration shall be carried out Japanese sovereignty, by which they meant after the war was over, which they knew would be in two or three years time. Japanese sovereignty shall be limited to the islands of Honshu, Hokkaido, Kyushu, Shikoku, and such other minor islands as we shall determine. In other words, it was a statement about the disposition of what would be a defeated Japan at the end of the war. So what you might claim? Well, plenty of Chinese commentators were, and indeed are, <laughs> making the claim that this meant that China's present day territorial claims on the islands in the middle of the East China Sea, known in China as Diaoyu, uh, in Japan as Senkaku, to Taiwan, in fact, also as the Diaoyu Tai, um, in this reading should be given to the Chinese because that's what the Cairo Declaration says. It has to be said that this interpretation is not shared by many other actors. I'm not making any statement about the justice of this at the moment. Uh, other people, lawyers can sort that out. But I am pointing out that it's a clear example of a, a, a present day political shift in China's international relations, which uses World War II history as a clear angle as to how it's going to be uh, put, uh, put forward. In other words, events relating to this gentleman here, Chiang Kai-shek, were being wholly incorporated without any explicit acknowledgement into the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party and PRC narrative about the formation of the post-war international order. So as uh, Sima Pingbang, that blogger we mentioned at the beginning observed, the American presence in Asia draws its justification essentially, at least as its start point, from the sacrifices made by American troops to recover the region from Japan during World War II. And China over time has developed a very similar justification for its own desire for greater influence. And that's some 14 million or more Chinese being killed during the eight years of the war against Japan. Uh, the argument that without that, China might well have fallen to Japanese imperialism. And I want to use actually an argument from a source from a historian who I think in some ways is a perhaps rather more objective source than Hu Tiaomu, who was in the end a very senior Communist Party official. This is from uh, uh, Professor Huang Meizhen of uh, Fudan University, a very well-known historian of the Republican period uh, based in Shanghai at the time. And he wrote also in that same year, 1987, the following lines, which basically this is the argument as to why, you know, Chinese historians, as well as political figures with an axe to grind, would argue that China's World War II really does matter for uh, international order. So Huang Meijun wrote, the war delayed the outbreak of the Pacific War so that the Western democracies could strengthen their strategies and gain precious time. It created an obstructive factor for the militaries of Japan, Germany, and Italy. It reduced the burden of the Soviet Union's defensive war. It strongly supported the war of the British and the Americans in the Pacific, and it, pro and it protected an important supply line to the Soviet Union for the US and UK. Now, you could quibble with various aspects of the historiography, perhaps, of Professor Huang's statement, but the wider argument that, look, China's resistance for years and years really matters is what's at the heart of that argument. And while leveraging that um, argument into part of international strategy was really nothing more than a kind of dream in the 1980s, in recent years, it has been, I think, much more part of the creation of that international order. So in the last few minutes before we turn to commentary and, and questions, let me just give you a few of the present day, you know, last few years, implications of some of this. And I'll stick with the Cairo conference, if I may, because one of the things I want to get away from is the idea that all of this idea of World War II as a collective memory shaping international relations is purely a sort of propaganda exercise from the top in Beijing that everyone believes. And actually it's much more complex than that. So to give an example, in um, 2015, two years after the anniversary, 72nd anniversary, but the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, uh, oh, if I can make this work, let's just see. 
Yes, this movie came out. So uh, as you see, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for uh, Chinese historical movies. Uh, this movie, Kailo Xuanyan, Cara Decoration, came out. Uh, it's not a bad film, actually. And you'll see all sorts of key figures from that era in there. Uh, Joseph Stalin, you see up there, even though he wasn't actually uh, um, at the Cairo conference, as you'll see him from the picture. Uh, Winston Churchill with his bow tie, which in this film, intriguingly, is played by an American actor. So that was a, a, an interesting interpretation and various other figures. And amongst others, isn't that Chairman Mao in the middle? Now, I look back at the news photo. I'm sure that's Chiang Kai-shek. And then, oh, well, yeah, he seems to turn into Chairman Mao. Well, I wasn't the only one to be slightly taken aback by this uh, swift uh, uh, change. Since during the Cairo conference, uh, Chairman Mao was safely in Yan'an in Northwest China and didn't move anywhere else of that area during the war period. And of course, the Chinese internet, which is well known for having a pretty ironic sense of humor when it wants to, uh, started mocking the filmmakers mercifully for trying to essentially be, you know, more red than the emperor in a sense, and uh, and try and put forward an, a poster that they thought would appeal to the Communist Party. And so the Chinese internet came up with some of the following variations on the uh, Cairo Declaration poster. And here are some of my favorites. Uh, we have other people who, like Chairman Mao, were not at the Cairo conference. Kim Jong-un, uh, Saddam Hussein's particularly good there, I think. Um, who else have we got? Uh, Jack Ma, I think, there. And, uh, oh, yeah, Barack, uh, Barack Obama. So, you know, looking slightly dazed there, I have to say. And Colonel Gaddafi bringing up the rear. So, you know, a whole bunch of people there, I think, in China, pointing out that actually when the World War II propaganda element becomes too strong, people don't necessarily take it on board wholesale. And it's often things like discovering the stories of their own refugee grandparents that are much more inclined to uh, emotionally uh, take up people with this discourse in China than pure propaganda. Nonetheless, there are elements which, if you look uh, at it, show changes in the way in which uh, China is thinking about these issues. This victory parade in 2015, you know, huge parade through Tiananmen Square. The only occasion that I think that there's been this sort of huge Tiananmen Square parade for an event that is not directly linked to the Chinese Communist Party first and foremost. But for me, in the middle, one of the most interesting and moving moments was not this huge array of goose-stepping soldiers, but several veterans aged between 19 and 102 of the Second World War split between communist army veterans and nationalist army veterans being presented to Xi Jinping. In other words, not quite stated, but a heavily implied attempt to heal one particular fracture that has lasted, of course, for, for many decades, the split in the civil war of the 1940s, and essentially trying to heal it by pointing out that the Chinese were united against the, uh, the Japanese in World War II, unless, of course, they were in the Wang Jingwei collaborationist government, but strangely enough, that didn't get much of an appearance at the, uh, at the parade. A couple other references. Again, I mentioned the South China Sea, I'm making no claims here at all about the, uh, uh, the rightness or wrongness of these claims, but I would point out that it's in the immediate aftermath of World War II and the confidence that China gained as a victor in that particular society, uh, so particular conflict, that many of the current claims that are being used today began to formulate, including the 11 dash line famously on a map of the South China Sea put forward by the Nationalist Party in 1947. And occasionally you get metaphors that don't work out so well. I was intrigued also by the fact that one of the very few occasions when China had got some quite good publicity for one of its uh, uh, enterprises was actually a World War II or post-war metaphor, which was when people started to call the Belt and Road Initiative the new Chinese Marshall Plan. And this was actually taking off in the West in quite a big way. And you know, for most liberal Westerners, it's a very complimentary thing to call any kind of scheme. But the official Chinese propaganda outfits, including, you know, Xinhua, Global Times and so forth, really hated this idea and said this is outrageous. And of course, we have to remember that General George Marshall, to Westerners, is a great public servant, the man who won World War II. For the Chinese, he was the man who came up not with the Marshall Plan, but the Marshall negotiations in China in 1946, which signally failed to uh, resolve the incipient civil war between the communists and nationalists. And therefore, his brand name is not such a good thing in China compared to what it is in the uh, in the West. So just to say in there that international order post-World War II uh, metaphors and analogies work sometimes, but not always for the Chinese. To conclude my thoughts in just a moment or so, because we should move on to commentary, uh, as Club has kindly said, I put together some of these thoughts in the new book, China's Good War. And if some of you are moved to do so, I'd love to know your thoughts, should you read and want to give me any, any feedback. But if you don't do that and just stick with what we've had today, I think I would finish with one particular message. 
There are lots and lots and lots of different elements, economic, realist, military, and cultural and ideological that shape this big story of China's rise in the world and whether it's going to be able to cooperate with the West and the US in particular, or whether it's going to actually find itself in some sort of confrontation. I hope very much not the, uh, the latter. But I do think that understanding how China looks both at home and abroad at something that the rest of us in the West think about all the time, which is the Second World War, its legacy in shaping our societies. And we know this is true in Britain, where I'm speaking from, you know, Brexit is World War II. COVID is World War II. Everything is World War II. I'm not suggesting it's necessarily quite as pervasive as that in China, but actually that collective memory and the contested memories of World War II shape China's both domestic and international behavior more than 75 years on. And perhaps the comforting side of that in one way is that in that way, it's quite similar to Britain, the United States, France, Germany, Japan, whether they were Axis or allied powers, uh, Italy, I should add, with Flavia here on the, uh, the call as, uh, as well. And in that sense, it's a way of understanding not why China is so different from us, whoever us is. It's about why understanding why in many aspects, China actually shares the same hopes, fears, and dreams that we do. Thanks very much indeed. And I will now hand over to Julian for commentary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mitter, for these fascinating talks. There are already several questions which has arrived, so I'm sure the debate will be very rich at the end of the um, talk. Um, I will leave uh, the floor now to our uh, discussant for comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I will be brief, both because it is impossible to follow the, the brilliant talk that Rhonda just gave, and because there are so many interesting questions that have already come in, and I am sure many more to come, as Fabia has just said. Uh, I should say just it's, it's a real honor to, to be here speaking after Professor Mitter, uh, who among his many accomplishments has the black mark of having been my supervisor in my doctorate. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's really a privilege. And I should say that this new book is, is extraordinarily interesting and you've just gotten a taste of the richness uh, and texture that, is, uh, that is, is in what is actually quite a short book uh, for something that covers so much ground. So I, I wanna start just by saying that I was in Nanjing in January of this year. I went on a last research trip before the pandemic uh, and one of my stops was Nanjing and I went to the, uh, the museum there that, that commemorates and marks uh, and in some ways prosecutes the massacre that occurred during uh, China's good war there. And I was very struck by that exhibition, and this comes out very clearly in, in your book, by the theme of those who deny this history, the enemies who oppose the full true, with air quotes around true account that the Chinese leadership wishes to give, of course, the theme of Xi Jinping's uh, relationship to China's past has been one of restoring aspects of history, but also criticizing historical nihilism, as he calls it, the, the denial of these parts of China's history. And of course, that connects very profoundly to a relationship, not just to the past, but to the world today, to those who have alternative interpretations of history, as well as to the theme of justice that you foreground so compellingly in this talk. I, I wanna talk about two other dimensions as well. One which comes out very clearly in the book is the need for national myths of strength in a much stronger China. For those who study Chinese history, so much of the way in which that history has been told has been, of, has been centered on humiliation, on weakness, on China's subjugation by imperial powers and by other uh, hostile foreign forces. It seems to me that there is an effort in some of what you've described, yes, to keep that spirit alive, but also to tell stories of strength, of valorism, of of heroism, which is of course useful at a time when the shift in China's foreign policy from a low key approach from the Tao Guang Yang Hui, the hide your light and bide your time doctrine to a much more assertive approach to foreign policy. As Xi Jinping puts it, China has gone from 
getting rich to becoming powerful or qiang qi lai. Uh, that, of course, requires its own new myths. And it's, I wonder whether some of these myths are also a part of that. And I would end by, by saying that, you know, reading your book and, and hearing this, this lecture today reminded me of e a fact that even I as an American take for granted, which is how central World War II is to our conception of the international order and to the construction of that international order. And I was very struck by a point that you, you argue, I think very persuasively of China's self-image, evolving self-image as a founder of that order, as present at the creation, as you said. And of course, today, China is at once rewriting history, the dynamics that you narrate, while remaking aspects of international order within the system as it exists, and some that sit alongside, on top of, or outside of that system. And I suppose I end this, this comment by just saying that I wonder, and I, I, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to pose a question to Rana or if I can ask it as a rhetorical question, but I wonder whether these visions of international order, of the origins of that order in World War II and this highly contested moment in China's history, and these long post-wars, as you described, whether these visions are ultimately compatible, whether the desire to reclaim that founding moment uh, from Beijing's perspective is about reclaiming that moment as it has been understood by Americans and other uh, countries in the West, or perhaps about recasting, remaking the meaning of the founding of the order uh, in a way that is much more conducive to the nature of Chinese power today. So with that, I'll just say thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, this is a, it's, it's a brilliant book. I, I have it here and I encourage you all to buy it on Amazon or on Kindle or on a, from the bookstore of your choice. Uh, and uh, I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you so much. Um, before moving to the questions from the public, I don't know if you want to say something else in response, Rana, yes, please. I'll make a very brief comment. Well, first of all, to thank Julia for absolutely incisive comments as, as ever, and that's really very much appreciated. I think in terms of the very last question about the effectiveness of uh, the narrative strategy, let me just reply with something that essentially is very noticeable from literally the last few weeks, uh, which is what you might call 2020 being the year of competing wartime analogies. So, Back in August, which feels like a million years ago, it was during our first lockdown here in the UK rather than the second, uh, but also, of course, the 75th anniversary of the defeat of Japan. The discourse that we saw in China, the way in which commemorations appeared in the papers and you know, mostly online, of course, because like the rest of the world, there were no public gatherings, was very much that story of China as a founder member of the international order and about international cooperation. And that was tied, of course, to COVID as well. Um, it is notable that the one of the metaphors of choice used by Xi Jinping very early on was that China was fighting a renmin a people's war. Uh, against the virus. And that was exactly the same phrase used against the Japanese back in the 30s, but now it's, you know, the invisible enemy. Fast forward to where we are now. As you'd have seen perhaps even more a few weeks ago than today, but still there, we have a big stress on the Korean War 70 years ago that it broke out in, uh, uh, in, in the Chinese media. And of course, this becomes clear when you realize that in China, usually the Korean War is not called the Korean War. It is called Kang Mei, the resistance to America war. And actually the same Kang as resistance to the Japanese in the, in the World War II scenario. In other words, these two discourses and the historical metaphors and analogies around them are being used for different sorts of, you know, frankly, in their own terms, incompatible messages about the outside world. So the only thing I'd say off the back of that is, I agree that I think China's messaging on this is entirely incompatible. But if we've seen the messaging from Britain post-Brexit, the United States under President Trump, uh, you know, a whole variety of countries you can think of, I don't think any country has a purely consistent national narrative about itself. And in that again, perhaps China is no different from the rest of us. All right, thank you very much. Let's uh, open the floor to the question. Um, there are several, Let's start with the first one from Nathan uh, Watson, who asks, uh, it seems like the China's um, World War II history is mainly filled with appalling massacres against them and big humiliations. There doesn't seem to be a China's uh, equivalent of Midway, Stalingrad, El Alamein or D-Day. 
Why is it remembered so favorably in Chinese history? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> you can't have a Zoom call without one moment where you have to shout out you're muted. Otherwise, it just, you know, it's, it doesn't tick the box. Nathan, thank you for a very good question there. Well, first of all, I think it's fair to say that in the Chinese narrative, which, you know, is obviously more complex and more granular than the knowledge of, of China's wartime experience that most of the rest of the world have, has, even if there's no one particular moment that's the Stalingrad, you know, the moment that, that the war turns, uh, turns around, I would say that, first of all, I think there is still a great deal of um, kudos attached to certain elements of resistance that are, that are stressed today. And the one that, again, I explore in, in some detail in the book, but I didn't really talk about today, is the city of Chongqing and its resurrection of its own wartime history as the temporary national capital of China, uh, nationalist capital, of course, not communist capital, but actually the fact that it suffered, you know, numerous air raids, you have tens of thousands of people killed in the, the bombing, and that it stays there, you know, for a short time, technically, and as the Chinese would say, as one of the four great allied wartime capitals, you know, Washington, London, Moscow, Chongqing, uh, may not may sound a bit esoteric to those uh, on the outside, but in, in China, there's an argument that's being made for that. So in that sense, the argument, I think, is being made that there is sort of a genuine element of Chinese resistance that should count in the same sort of way, even if it's not set, set piece battles in quite the way that you get in, in, in other theatres. In terms of what it means for that wider sense of, of, of Chinese um, identity, one of the things that I think is quite important, very important actually, understanding what the significance of it is to wider Chinese society, is that I think it's really not and I said this briefly before in the international side, but it's true in the domestic side too. It's really not about beating up on the Japanese. I mean, yes, people do do that sometimes. And yes, you have some kind of, you know, fierce TV shows about, you know, shooting down Japanese enemies. But actually it's much more, I think, about creating a kind of a language, a narrative for contemporary Chinese, young and old, doesn't have to be, you know, younger people necessarily, who feel a sort of spiritual, if you want to call it that emptiness about, you know, consumerism is working well for them. And, you know, there are jobs and the economy is going fine. But somehow the sense of mission isn't really there. And it goes in different directions for different people. For neo Maoists, who Jude Blanchett has written about brilliantly recently in his book, The New Red Guards, it's about going back to a kind of invented version of the Cultural Revolution with no Red Guard violence, but lots of kind of austerity, uh, uh, digging up fields in the countryside and feeling good about yourself. And this sort of fantasy version of the Second World War is quite similar. Um, familiar to many Brits, I think, you know, we all stayed, stayed together under the bombs and, and worked, uh, worked together in that way. But that's much more a story about the way that China feels about itself than it is a story about how China feels either about the Japanese or indeed about the Americans. And I think that's actually the most important element. Thank you very much. Um, another question from uh, Shang Shou, who said, um, the present day Chinese party state has a clear preference in mobilization via external conflicts like the Opium War, Boxer Intervention, intervention, uh, Russo-Japanese and Sino-Japanese uh, wars or the Korean War, as opposed to the earlier CCP propaganda approaches, which also stressed the 1911 anti-imperial Manchu struggle, the CCP's long march mythos and the anti-KMT narrative epitomized in the fit Chiang Kai-shek liberate the whole, uh, the whole of China trope. One thinks perhaps on the blockbuster hit, the 800, as state-backed media baptized GMD soldier, soldiers to Chinese hero, heroism. When did this shift in Chinese ideological emphasis away from Marxist-Leninist ideology towards ethno-nationalism centered around a, mili a unitary Zonghua Minzu, sorry for my pronunciation. Oh, Minzu, yeah. Sorry, occur. Oh, Minzu, yeah. When, when did this occur, basically? Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Flavia. Thanks for reading out actually a, a long and very clever, but quite lengthy question with great skill there. I'm impressed by your, your chairing there. Um, so Sean, great question. Thank you for that. Um, I would say that actually there's complexity even in this. So first of all, the actual question you asked, and I'm gonna slightly take issue with it, if I may, because you asked, when did the shift in Chinese ideological emphasis move away from Marxist-Leninist ideology towards ethno-nationalism centered around a unitary you know, Chinese nation, if you want to call it that, Zhonghua Minzu? Actually, I don't think the Marxist-Leninism ever went away, and actually it's becoming more prominent again now, 
having been a little bit sort of underplayed, perhaps in the eras of previous presidents, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintai. It never went away, but it was certainly, uh, it certainly made a, a revival. And if you uh, see the number of occasions on which actually Xi Jinping's speeches and um, articles under his name anyway, published in Zhu Shu, you know, the major uh, ideological journal of the, uh, of the party, use very strongly, you know, essentially Marxist-Leninist language drawn ultimately from Hegelian ideas, you know, the uh, terms like um, uh, dojong, struggle, um, uh, maodun, uh, contradiction. These are all actually terms which show that the Marxist-Leninist understanding of the world is by no means absent. In fact, it's very present, I think, in a lot of the ways in which China sees its own position. As I say, it's by no means the only thing that goes on, but I think the idea of a shift away from it, as opposed to thinking, I think of Chinese thinking about nationhood and identity as a set of streams which actually are concurrent in certain ways, uh, can I think be misleading? Because otherwise, you end up in this sort of slightly sterile position where you're going to say, well, if the Chinese don't really believe in communism anymore, then why do they do X and Y? And I think that's not the most productive way to think about it. But the other half of your, your question, I think it is the case, there's no doubt about it, that a huge amount of cultural production in China today is very nationalistic in any sense of that word. But I still think you need to look at it with a certain amount of, uh, of, of nuance. So let's take that movie, uh, The 800, which actually I discuss in the, in the book. I don't know how many people had a chance to see it. It was briefly on release in Britain before lockdown, but it didn't do terribly well. But I, I did have a chance to see it. It's still, I think, the best-selling <laughs> box office movie in the world uh, this year, because so few other movies have been released. And I think it's made over $300 million at the, uh, the box office. For those who don't know, it's basically this tale of the last stand of Chinese soldiers at a warehouse in Shanghai in 1937 against the Japanese. But they're nationalist soldiers, Kuomintang soldiers, Chiang Kai-shek soldiers. And that matters. That's interesting in the PRC market of today that that movie is released and makes huge amounts of money. Doubly so because a year ago when it was supposed to be released, it was yanked at very short notice from the Shanghai Film Festival and basically you know, put in a box somewhere. And this was noticed around the world. And the reason apparently was that uh, a group of prominent um, sort of Chinese Communist Party elders associated with what are called the Red Families, a Red Culture Association, said, how dare you release a film pra praising the nationalist anti-Japanese resistance in the 100th, sorry, not 100th, the 70th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. But one year later, with 1945 plus 75 being the anniversary, it turned out to be, uh, to be fine. So, you know, there is a lot of variation in this. And I think if we just end up seeing these sorts of productions as being nationalist in some sort of small N, but all encompassing, encompassing, encompassing sense in which Beijing sort of de defines everything from above, I think that's not complex enough. Other things are going on. There is pushback. There is sort of attempts by regions of China, I think, to tell more of their own story. Excluded groups such as nationalist war veterans, and frankly, these days, their families, since there aren't very many of them left alive, to tell their stories. So nationalism is very, very real in China, but it's not just one thing. It's the product of a whole variety of different influences. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, Julian, if you have anything to add, feel free to <laughs> Okay. Um, next question from uh, Wei Liang Song, who uh, asked if you can say something about the reconstruction of China's um, World War II experience in relation to its kind of expansion overseas, particularly in places like Africa, which are perceived as a new form of colonialism in the West, but are propagated as a banning act to, to assist economic development in Africa uh, domestically. Sure. Um, thanks very much, uh, uh, William, for a, a very interesting question. I would say, to be honest with you, that the overseas reach of China in terms of economic development is not in and of itself one that's most obviously linked to this particular World War II narrative. I think the World War II narrative is very important, but I'm the first to say that it doesn't encompass everything. And I think sometimes a the theory can get too capacious if you try and fit everything else in. But there is one very specific and I think interesting connection which should be better noted, which is that sometimes when we see what's going on with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is of course much more baggy and kind of inchoate in, in, in certain, uh, uh, certain ways than uh, it might uh, appear. It's, it's not all run by like five people in Beijing pulling levers and making it all happen. It's, it's much more baggy and disparate than, than that. 
but it's by no means the first time that there has been a sort of broadly concerted effort by China to use the idea of economic development as a means not only of you know, providing new markets, but also actually creating that kind of moral narrative of doing good in the world. So an earlier period, for instance, was back in the 1950s and 60s after the Bandung Conference when China became you know, the advocate of the three worlds. And in places like um, East Africa, the Tanzam Railway between Tanzania and Zambia, very much produced with uh, Chinese um, uh, cooperation and, and support, but at a time when China had far fewer financial resources to offer on this than it does now. But the one that I think is even less well known, and I've been writing a bit about it in you know, various academic articles and you know, just want to flag up, is the immediate post-war period when not the communists, but the nationalists started the idea that having been a victor country in World War II, being the only non-Western country uh, on the um, UN Security Council, I'm not counting the Soviet Union as being uh, Asian in this, in this context, I have to say, uh, that Chinese experience and also Chinese rights to actually redefine the order should make themselves felt in a whole variety of international institutions. And you see there's quite a lot being done by Guomindang uh, authors and activists and uh, planners at that time through agencies such as the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, both to reconstruct China and to paint China as an exemplar of how a non-Western country throwing off the shackles of empire can actually both do good for itself and provide an example for the world. Now you will re realize that the end of the civil war, which basically you know, ended nationalist China's um, uh, capacity to have any kind of great influence in Asia, put a stop to that story. But you can certainly see the ghosts or the bones or whatever analogy you want to use of that earlier effort in what comes later in the 1950s and 60s, and very much, I think, in the incarnation of China you have now. And I think, in, indeed, that experience is now being looked at in China, that late 1940s experience by scholars there, with the kind of interest that they certainly would never have had, even, I think, you know, 10, 10 or so years ago. Thank you very much. Other questions? I think we have time for another couple of questions, if sure. you, you agree. Uh, Stefan Pietner uh, asking, what is China's stance on the use of nuclear weapons and uh, at, at the end of World War II? And how, if so, does it affect China's own nuclear posture? Sure. Well, actually, one of the bits of the quote from Hu Tiaomu, the um, Chinese uh, um, ideolo ideological czar um, who I read, at, which I left out of my quotation, is one where he says, uh, you know, another important event in 1945 was the dropping the atomic bombs. And then this very sen sententious um, uh, uh, parenthesis, he says, of course, we do not approve of the use of such weapons. I was thinking, yeah, but you guys basically kind of got uh, Chen Chi Sun, this amazing uh, scientist back from California, and had your own new nuclear program built about 20 years before you wrote this. So you're not that opposed to nuclear weapons. You can also see actually, and again, I know at King's London, you have uh, the fantastic um, Professor Nicola Horsburgh in War Studies, who's written an amazing book on China's views of nuclear order. And if you want to see the earlier history of this, do turn to Nicola's book, which I think is, is brilliant on this, uh, on, this, on this subject. In terms of how it fits into the narrative here though, I'll just, because we've got limited time, just say one brief thing. I think there is a very interesting contrast between the attitude, say, in Japan and in China on this question. In Japan, for the vast majority of people, the discourse is one about how a nuclear weapon, because Japan had suffered under it, is a, is a terrible thing that they would want to make sure that no other country ever did. It usually is a discourse, I have to say, that shies away a bit for the reasons for China being, so Japan being in World War II in the first place, which tend to be downplayed in, in some quarters. But the, the idea of the atomic bomb as a human tragedy, I think, is absolutely central to that Japanese discourse. And it's widely shared around the world for very, very good reason. I would say that I find the Chinese discourse about it these days a bit more ambivalent. On the one hand, yes, language about nuclear weapons are terrible, we must never use them. But you do find also a lot more of a statement that you tend to get in parts of the US as well, that without the atomic bombing, the war might have gone on for a very long time. Certainly, I think that if the atomic bombings hadn't happened in the summer of 1945. It's a moot point whether the nationalist government in China, Chiang Kai-shek's government, could have survived because it really wasn't on its uppers by 1945. And it may have had a reprieve for that reason because of the bombings. Certainly Wang Shijie, the uh, nationalist foreign minister of China in you know, 1945-46, was very enthusiastic about the atomic bomb and spent a lot of time at the London conference asking basically how uh, China could get hold of one, uh, which perhaps it is fortunate they did not manage to do during what would become the Chinese, uh, Chinese Civil War. 
Thank you very much. Um, last question from Jimen, who asked about uh, the Chinese weaknesses, because there is this view that China is impervious to criticism and is growing strong, uh, and but there is a lack of understanding about their weaknesses. So in your view, what are China's weaknesses? Absolutely, and thank you, Jimen, which I think uh, P.G. Woodhouse would have described as an assumed and fictitious name, unless you've got uh, rather unusual uh, parents, but anyway. Um, Chinese weaknesses, as well as uh, in the worldview, as well as uh, as well as the strategy. Well, I think I'll make that the last question, but I'll start, if I may, with the strengths, because I think if you're going to answer that, you need to put both sides. In terms of worldview, I think the Chinese have, I mean, say the Chinese, you know, the Chinese Communist Party state, which is really what we're talking about here, worked out certain things that I think have lasting value if they know how to use them. I think the stress on the idea of economic development of other societies as a means of spreading your um, idea of what strong states and your state order is, is not without its merit. First, because you know there is demonstrable improvement, not in all cases, but in some cases, uh, certainly many parts of sub-Saharan Africa from that approach. And I think that is actually something that you know has a lot of merit to it. Otherwise, the West wouldn't have been trying the same thing, or indeed the Soviet Union, for much of the Cold War. However, the weaknesses are real, and they relate. You know, I'll just do two or three off the top of my head, but you know there are others, I'm sure. One is that if you're going to do that, you do have to be consistent in terms of pushing the idea of development as a good for others and not just for yourself. I don't share the view that the whole BRI is a kind of great Chinese plot to try and basically colonize the rest of the world. Not least because I don't think it's actually organized enough to be able to actually manage that, even if they wanted to. But I do think there's been carelessness in terms of issues such as, you know, the terms on which loans. A lot of loans have been offered. It's much more actually like the financial crisis in America, where people are giving mortgages on kind of, you know, houses in Florida that were right on the Gulf Coast before a hurricane came along. You know, there's a lot of projects that the Chinese invest in because nobody else actually wants to. And then they get surprised when uh, you know, it doesn't really work out. So a bit of judgment there would be useful. And I think the other thing, let's just make it this one other thing. Uh, I do think the values issue is important. China likes to put forward the idea that actually what's great about taking Chinese investment money is that China's not going to ask you about your human rights record. It's not going to ask you about uh, internal uh, you know, political repression or any of these sorts of issues. But I think that's a really short term strategy, because what we know is that when people become more prosperous, they don't necessarily become more democratic. That's one thing I think we have learned, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, the, the old line that prosperity and democracy go together has proved not to be, it's sometimes true, but it's not necessarily true. But I think it's true that they do become more demanding. They will want certainly more participation or say in terms of the wider agenda. It can be economic participation. I think it's no accident that China is one of the single most entrepreneurial countries in the world. And I think, you know, a country that can produce a Jack Ma has things to say for it, as well as a country that can produce um, uh, a, a Sergey Brin or um, a, a, a Bill Gates. But that having been said, I think that China doesn't do enough to enable people to join in that conversation and to explain in its own terms what the weaknesses are as well as the strength in its own position. And in particular, I would say that has to do with speaking out and criticizing on issues to do with individual civil liberties. China's case is that these things are secondary to collective rights. I would say that I think over time, they're gonna find that they're both important, but one is not to the exclusion of the other. They work together and interact. So I'll offer that as my thought for where China's getting some things right and where it has a lot of work to do to make them much, much better. All right, thank you very much. And Julian, I don't know if you have anything to add as a final thought. No, only to say uh, thank you to Professor Mitter and to urge all of you once again to get a copy of his great book. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, of course, both in the chat and in the Q and A section, we are receiving a lot of, uh, you know, um, a lot of people are thanking you for the lecture and uh, uh, looking forward to read your book, of course. Um, okay, so um, I thank you very much uh, all the people who has um, who have joined uh, us for this annual lecture, and I want to thank you. To thank very much, of course, our speakers. I'm sure with some imagination you are uh, 
uh, hearing the big round of applause uh, that everybody is uh, tributing to you as usual. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again, um, everybody. Um, you will find the recording of, of this lecture on uh, YouTube, on the World Studies Department uh, YouTube channel. So feel free to <laughs> watch it again. Thank you again. Uh, see you next year with the annual lecture and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you all very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to speak to you all. Thank you. Bye bye.